So I've had a dust collector in my shop for about as long as I can remember. Well, it's actually more of a Frankenstein's monster of a dust collector. See, it started as a Harbor Freight rolling dust cart and slowly morphed into a wall-mounted motor with a floppy filter sack to catch the finer particles. It has a good cyclone separator that dumps into a big garbage can and a single long flexible hose that I move from tool to tool as I need them. It works, but it leaves a lot to be desired. If you want to see more details about this old setup, there's a link to the original video in the description. This unit didn't actually pull away all the dust from my various machines, it just slurped up the easy to reach table scraps and left behind plenty of mess to deal with later. In fact, it wasn't until I rearranged the shop for this video that I realized the enclosed base on my joiner was packed so full of sawdust that you couldn't find room for one more toothpick even if you were a certified Tetris master. Considering that space is where the motor lives, I'm lucky I didn't start a fire. I did have the foresight to put a viewing window in the lid back in the day, but it's really easy to forget to check it. If that happens, the cyclone chokes up and the filter bag gets packed full in a hurry. When that happens, not only is it a pain to unclog, but the process leaves me covered in the dust that I had managed to contain. This is messy and it's also a health issue. Breathing in that fine dust is bad for your lungs, which is part of why we're trying to collect and filter it in the first place. So for years, what I thought was a perfectly adequate dust collector was honestly more like a big, loud shop vac. It wasn't until my recent upgrade that I really understood what good dust collection is. So let me introduce you to my new Oneida V-System 3000 dust collection system. It's not just a dust collector, it is the whole system, plumbing run all the way across the shop, starting with six inch pipe and tapering down where the tools need different types of airflow blast gates, flexible hoses that are rigid so that the amount of horsepower in this doesn't collapse those flexible hoses. Uh, we have a 55 gallon drum of storage as opposed to a 35 gallon garbage can with my old system. So almost double, okay, don't check my math, but I can get close to twice the work done before I have to go empty this. And all I have to do is take the ring off, roll it outside, and I can either dump it in the tractor to haul away or just haul it off with the dolly itself. Uh, it has a viewing window so I can look and see how full it is, but just like in my old system, that's easy to screw up. So it has a infrared sensor, which is this little yellow guy, and you can adjust how far that actually reads, how high up, how close to the sensor you wanna let that dust level get. Then your flashing warning light goes off, so you actually have a bright, flashing light that says, hey, dummy, empty this. And that's really handy. I've, I've actually run into it a couple of times so far. I have it just sitting on the drum right now because it's actually a pretty good spot to see it from all of my tools, all my workflows coming this way. But it does have enough cord that I'll probably get it mounted up higher when I'm really happy with how my whole setup is working here. So, new system, tons of horsepower, great HEPA filter with easy clean out if I need to. All of this was cool because I didn't have to think of any of it. What you do is you create a little graph paper map and a list of all of your tools and where they are and it helps if you say what sort of port sizes you have on each one of your tools and then send it off to Oneida and they send you back a list of all of the parts and a map layout of where all this stuff should go and where all of the parts go in relation to each other. So I didn't do any thinking, I just acquired parts, put them together and threw them up. It was really, really easy. Now there is one complication in that and it's a bit of a side story and we're gonna get to that in just a minute. But for now, let's go put all the pieces together. Let's show you kind of how we get to this point. Oneida includes some very good, comprehensive instructions, so rather than going too in-depth here, I'm going to hit the main points for the assembly process. It starts by assembling the frame that will hold up the cyclone and motor. Following the diagram, I put all the pieces together up on my workbench and only loosely tightened the hardware. Then I lowered the floppy assembly to the ground so it was standing upright. Tightening the hardware after the frame was standing under its own weight helped to make sure that everything was lined upright and all four legs were flat on the ground. I did have to make a few tweaks after I moved it to its permanent home because my floor is very uneven and full of cracks from frost heaving. I spent a bit of time dismantling part of my shop to make room for the new collector. As it turned out, I ended up making an even more drastic change to my layout than I had planned, but this whole corner was going to get changed anyway, so it was work that still needed to be done. 
A foam gasket gets installed on top of the cyclone to create an airtight seal against the bottom of the fan housing. Then the cyclone goes into the frame with the inlet pointed in the direction indicated by the layout map. Then it gets lined up with the mounting holes around the perimeter before installing the bolts and tightening them down. Next the fan housing goes on, and once again it's important to clock the outlet in the correct direction. You bolt it down by installing the bolts through the top. Until now, everything has only been mildly heavy, but for the motor assembly itself, you better get a second set of hands involved. I rolled my workbench into place so we had a big, solid surface to stand on, then Katie and I lifted the motor and set it on top before tightening more bolts to lock it in place. There's an elbow that gets attached to the fan housing, and a support brace helps take a little of the weight off of it. I put the dust bin on the filter using J-bolts, then I flipped it over and checked to see if the top hat would fit. Realizing that this was actually just a drop-in silencer, I threw it in the top of the filter, then hung the whole thing from the elbow using more J-bolts. These funky bolts make it easy to remove and clean the filter in the future if it gets plugged with fine dust. So really quick, I need to stop and explain something. Uh, this right here is the monkey wrench that I threw at this whole process. See, I had sent off my list and my requirements, and they sent me back a map, and I started working on it, and originally, the dust collector was going to go right here, about three feet down from where my original one was. Um, but in the process of taking the shop apart and starting to set the machine up and realizing that this is semi-permanent and knowing that I had always wanted a bigger planer, I didn't really want to have to take things apart and set it back together if I were to have bought this a year down the road, something like that. So I started looking at sales and turns out this thing was on sale at the time all of this was going on. So I bought it, which complicated everything because nothing fit where it originally was planned to. So I spent a little bit of time and rearranged my entire shop. So now the dust collector moves from here to that back corner. The joiner moves from that back wall to this whole wall is just joiner space. Um, this back end is actually for my mobile tools so that the stuff that I don't use very often can roll over and get hooked up individually when they need it. Over here was my miter station, now it's against that back wall underneath the window. The workbench turned a little bit and rolled out into the center. And then the table saw moved way across the room. It was sitting exactly where I'm standing and it just rolled over six or eight feet. But actually now that this is all put back together, this is a much more efficient set up a much more efficient workflow than what I had before. So I made Oneida set me all up with one way and then I contacted them and said, hey, I screwed it all up. Can you help me? And they redid the whole thing, drew a new map and said, you're going to need three additional fittings to get this thing hooked up. And that was it. That was the whole thing. It was a two day process for them to get my information make some changes in their software, and ship out new stuff. So three days after I told them, I was back to putting stuff together. So now that the dust collector is assembled and all the tools, old and new, are in their new homes, it's time to run ducting to them. Since every system is going to be different, I'm just going to give you some points I picked up along the way. First of all, assemble as much as you can on the ground. It's much easier than trying to fit one piece at a time together from the top of a ladder. A straight segment at the start of your main line ensures maximum airflow. Oneida recommends a minimum of one to two feet before you introduce a curve. Since my main line is in a major walkway, I went with roughly 20 inches before I curved the line up to the ceiling. I figured this was a good compromise between airflow and avoiding banging my head on the pipe. From here, it's just a matter of branching off from the main line to reach all of the tools in the shop. Right away, I needed to branch off to the far wall, but I also needed to avoid some junk on the ceiling, so I needed a very slight bend in the line. To do this, I used a 90 degree fitting and straightened it out so it only curved a little bit. Smoothly adjusting a 90 degree elbow into some other angle is simple. Just make a mark on the outside of each segment, then rotate every mark in the opposite direction, keeping left turns lined up and right turns lined up. With the bent pipe in place, followed by a Y, I used straps screwed into my sheeted ceiling to keep everything from crashing down on me while I worked. Later on, I'll tighten these straps, but leaving them with some slop now makes it easier to come back and tape the seams. After the Y, there was a section of straight pipe, then another 90 and another straight, which is the start of my first drop down to a tool. This piece is a Y and a reducer all in one, which turns a six inch pipe into two fours. 
I put blast gates into the end of each of these, then attached hose adapter fittings to the bottom of each blast gate. I come back to this seam later on and run a bead of silicone around the top and bottom of the blast gate to prevent any air leaks. I figured out later that it's much easier to put silicone on the lips of the blast gate first, then assemble the fittings and screw them together. At this point, I can attach a heavy duty flexible hose with a hose clamp, then attach the other end to the tool, in this case, my relocated joiner. From here on out, it's mostly an exercise in repetition. Assemble what you can on the ground, fit all the assemblies together, attach the drops to their respective tools, then come back and seal off any seams that you missed. Now that we are up and running, and I didn't even have to dismantle my old unit to get everything in place, it's time for some head-to-head -head comparisons. Starting with a noise test, let's just get a frame of reference. This is my dinky little dehumidifier. It's quiet enough that sometimes you can forget that it's even running. Using a free decibel meter app on my phone, it looks like it runs at around 50 decibels. With nothing on in the shop except for the lights, we're getting low to mid 20s, then you can actually see my footsteps jump to the low 40s when I walk over to turn on the old system. We're going to say that this runs at about 75 decibels. Next, let's see what I get when I fire up the new Oneida V system, which is designed to ramp up slowly to increase the longevity of the motor. Looks like this operates at about 80 decibels, so it's a little louder according to my phone, but considering this is a 3 horsepower motor running on 220 power versus the other machine which is only 2 horsepower on 110, I thought the gap would be bigger. So here we have a 5 gallon bucket of sawdust. It has everything from big planer shavings to fine palm sander dust. Let's see how long it takes the Franken collector to clean up this mess. Looks like about 40 seconds. And to test the actual strength of the suction, here's a stack of smooth boards that start light and get progressively heavier. The little walnut is no problem, neither is the plywood or the medium walnut. It lifted the maple, but it was close. The thick oak and large walnut are just too heavy for the suction of this system to overcome. Now to run the same test with the Oneida V system, I dumped the dust back out on the floor and even used the same connector on the end of the hose to keep things as equal as possible. Looks like about 24 seconds, almost half the time it took the other machine. Oh, and check this out. That test, it was done with the five inch blast gate for the planer left open. It probably could have completed this test faster, but when I shut this gate, there's so much suction in the system that it actually starts to lift the mostly empty drum off the ground. As for the board lifting test, the little walnut was a joke and the plywood was easy after I flipped it over to the non-perforated side. The medium walnut, maple, and thick oak all lifted off the ground easily enough. The big walnut finally became a challenge, so I closed off one of the 4-inch ports I'd left open. Then it gave up without a fight. I threw in a thick chunk of maple for a last show of strength, and it couldn't quite get the job done, but I think if I had found the exact center and kept the board balanced, it would have worked. So that's all nice information to have, but how well does it actually work? Let's take another look at this clip from the beginning. When I take a pretty aggressive cut at the joiner, a hefty amount of dust sprays out around the base of the tool. Now let's look at that same example using the new V system. Look at that, there's no dust sneaking out through the gaps in the machine. This system does way more than clean up the easy table scraps. It actively jumps up and cleans the crumbs right off your plate when you're not looking. So through all that testing, I was kind of messing with uh, opening and closing different blast gates to see if I could control different flow rates and speeds and even sounds. Um, and I didn't really have to do that because this thing has what they call their smart boost built into the system. When it feels a change in the resistance, uh, all your, uh, your blast gates closed versus open, it'll actually change the amount of horsepower it's using to keep the airflow more consistent across the board. So whether you're shooting through a big hose or a little bitty one, the power is kind of the same. 
Um, now the other thing, the decibel test, what that doesn't really tell you is what it actually sounds like. I did a medium to deep dive on what different decibel levels are and what they should mean to you because it's, it's a sliding scale. It's almost exponential growth for decibel levels. So even though they were only three decibels apart, actually that really wasn't that significant. But from 60 to 70 decibels is roughly twice as loud. From 70 to 80 is roughly twice as loud. From 70 to 90 is roughly four times as loud, if I'm remembering what I looked up correctly. Don't hold me to that. But also, I looked up a bunch of different sources and a lot of them were fairly inconsistent. 60 was like normal conversation. 70 was like your alarm clock going off. 80 was a hairdryer. And a different sources said different things, but that's kind of a, a good baseline. What everybody kind of agreed on was between 80 and 90, prolonged exposure is going to damage your hearing. So both of my machines technically registered as below uh, hearing dangerous levels, but it's loud enough and long enough you should wear earplugs anyway. But the one thing that seemed huge to me that you can't pick up on the microphone, you can't pick up on that decibel meter on my phone, is the tone. This thing just makes a noise. It just sounds like a tool that's running. That Harbor Freight motor hummed at such a pitch that if I had earplugs and earmuffs on, my brain would still vibrate. It found the right frequency to drive my brain crazy. It shocked me to know that it was actually quieter than this one because of everything in the shop, that thing made the absolute most noise to my senses, but apparently not to recording devices. Anyway, Going forward, I have two tools that I'm going to hook up to this that aren't hooked up yet. I have a belt and disc sander and I have my bandsaw. The trick is neither one of those has a way to connect them. So there will be a video coming up. I am going to install a dust collection port on this, but this was actually my wife's grandpa's saw that I got from my wife's grandma. And I can't bring myself to cut a hole in the metal door, so I'm going to build it a its own custom wooden door that'll seal up a little bit tighter and then I can get a dust collection port on it. So that'll be part of the video. And then I'm also going to try to come up with some kind of a box to contain the dust in this belt sander, disc sander, stationary tool thing. And then there'll probably just be an update on how this thing has been working for me. And that about does it for this one, guys. Huge, huge thank you to Oneida for sponsoring this video. Uh, as always, all the links to stuff that you might be interested in is down in the description. If you think you need a new system like this, which you absolutely do, uh, links are down in the description. You can get a hold of the people at Oneida. You can go do some research for yourself and take a look at all of the cool options that they have. If this is too big, if this is too small, they have something for everybody. So thank you very much for watching, guys. I will see you next time.